at Princeton and soon to be at the Paris School of Economics. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for having me. Um, it's very exciting for me to be at this sort of multi-interdisciplinary uh, event. I typically only present this stuff. I'm a, a micro-econ theorist, so I present in a very institutionalized way. So I'm delighted to be uh, at this broader audience and, and getting feedback from you guys. So um, I just came off the job market. This is my job market paper. I'll, um, I'm going to give you a succinct version of it. So I'll be talking about ratings, design, and barriers to entry. So you know, typically I'll start with a long motivation about why we should care about this stuff at this conference. I could have synced, sunk the entire first two slides. I mean, I think we're all on the same page that uh, online platforms are, uh, are ubiquitous and very important these days. Okay, so I'm focusing on these sort of rating platforms. Uh, Yelp and Expedia are good examples for services. Uh, rate MDs for medical doctors. So, you know, upwards of 80% of patients now check their doctor's ratings before deciding whether to have a, um, um, to choose them or not. Uh, Zomato is a restaurant platform. So, as we've heard throughout the day, I'm delighted that Chiara is before me with Susan. I mean, this is, uh, you know, well known now, the welfare gains that have accrued to the market as a result of these platforms coming online. Okay, so on the one hand, they reduce frictions like search frictions, so they allow trader counterparties to discover each other more efficiently. And on the other hand, so this is going to be the focus in my paper, they reduce informational frictions. Okay, uh, so in particular, by um, providing consumers with a host of previously generated feedback, they allow uh, consumers to make informed product decisions. Okay, so. This is um, a firm on Yelp. I'm not sure it's terribly visible for those of you at the back. So it's got a four star rating, but very importantly, after over four and a half thousand reviews. Okay, so potentially a, a lot of information there to help um, uh, consumers make their choice. Now, of course, the problem for the new entrant down the road is very different. Okay, whilst they have a high rating, they only have three reviews at the moment. Okay. So it might be that maybe just after a handful of bad reviews, some of which were bad luck, uh, possibly, faced with the, the choice between these two options, consumers flock to the incumbent instead. Okay? And this is sort of based simply on expected quality. Okay? Uh, as a consumer, I look at the four stars and I combine it with 4,000 reviews. I think this place is great. Whereas I look at four stars after eight reviews, I don't really know much about it. So the expected quality is still pretty low. All right? I, haven't, I haven't screened it yet. So for the new entrant, if the situation is really untenable, it might shut down after a very short period of time. Okay? And uh, what's worse, they might see all of this coming and think, why on earth should I sink the enormous fixed costs of setting up my restaurant and buying all the capital equipment? Uh, I might not even bother entering the market in the first place. Okay? So this is the story that's going to be at the heart of my analysis. It's this, um, it's this combination of incomplete information regarding the products that these firms have. Uh, combined with uh, this user-generated feedback in these platforms, giving rise to a barrier to entry to new firms in these markets. Okay? Uh, and of course, as we've heard throughout the day, the problem here would be that if high-quality firms are not participating in the market, this is ultimately to the, jet, you know, to the detriment of overall surplus and, and welfare in the platform. So this, is, this sort of story that I've just given you with these firms is intimately related to um, what we'd call the problem of the cold start problem. So um, you know, this is when new products in their life cycle have a difficult time um, getting sampled at the beginning because people don't want to use the product. They don't know much about it. They get stuck in this sort of reputational trap. Okay? They can't update their profile, and they don't get sampled, and then they just get stuck. Okay? The, the, the sort of novel aspect of my analysis here is going to uh, be in seeing how the cold start problem um, gives rise to an endogenous distribution of qualities, okay, via the exit and entry choices of the firms that are um, populating the market, okay. So, um, uh, my previous speakers have, uh, you know, talked about this very eloquently. Um, the entry margin turns out to be super relevant, okay. So there's a bunch of empirical papers. Uh, looking at this problem, this recent um, um, JP paper quantifies the effects of subsidizing entry costs for firms in a market that have very similar features to the one I'm looking at, sort of uncertain product quality, and they find the welfare benefits uh, are enormous. Okay, so this margin is, is empirically very relevant. 
Great. So just a bit more focus. So these are the two questions that I'm focusing on. Firstly, how do consumer reviews shape the dynamic incentives for firms to participate in these markets? And secondly, how should these platforms design their rating systems? Okay, so there's going to be a design problem at the heart of my analysis. It's going to be designing ratings in order to incentivize uh, market participants. Okay, so as if I haven't tried to motivate this enough, um, these are just a couple of quotes from Zomato's online blog showing that at least they're, they're thinking about these problems very, very carefully. So, so the first question they say, the penalty from a bad review could have been a death sentence, especially for a new place, as a low rating may prevent new customers from visiting the restaurant. Okay, so this is sort of elucidating this cold start problem that, that I was mentioning. Uh, secondly, on the design-related question, they say, while we have placed a very heavy focus on helping our users discover great food, one of our core missions for the next decade is to ensure the long-term success of restaurants. Okay, so thinking about long-run outcomes, but crucially, both sides of the market are coming into their, um, their, their platform design. Okay, so before I get to the, to the model, um, I briefly just want to go through the the setting that we're going to find ourselves in and just highlight the key results. So my, this is a, a very theoretical um, exercise. There'll be one empirical graph, but 99% theory, OK? So I'm going to build a model. It's going to have firms who make an entry and exit choice. They have a hidden quality. And crucially, the quality is going to be gradually revealed via um, consumer feedback, consumer reviews, OK? So for each firm, then we're going to have associated this rating. And the rating is going to be indicative of the underlying quality of the firm. Okay? So consumers are going to use these ratings for the different firms out there to help guide their product choice. Um, I'll obviously be a lot more specific on the details when I get to, get to the model. But that's the basic skeleton of the model. So the first part, I want to talk through the positive theory. So this is basically in a benchmark where um, I assume all information is available to everyone. Every consumer review that's generated for a firm is just posted automatically by the platform. Okay, so I'm going to characterize this equilibrium uniquely and uh, show existence. Also, I'll talk a bit about some of the more interesting empirical predictions that the model generates just as, as way of validation. Uh, but the focus is going to be on the normative theory. Okay, so this is where I look at this the second best problem of designing the ratings process for firms in order to shape market outcomes, OK? And uh, so the, the, the real, the simple takeaway from the entire exercise is that censorship policies can dominate transparent ratings, OK? To be more specific, what's going to be optimal is if I suppress incoming reviews for the highest rated firms in the platform, OK? So I stop these well-established incumbents from gaining more reviews and building a, a strong incumbency position for themselves, OK? The economic logic is going to be by doing this, I'm going to make it easier for new entrant firms to start making profits earlier in their life cycle, and that's going to stimulate entry and overall be beneficial to the platform, OK? So that's the basic mechanism. So, uh, you know, the contribution here is really a theoretical contribution in, in seeing how we can... Um, do ratings design information design to shape um, outcomes at the sort of industry level, okay? Um, whereas typically the literature is focused on a, a couple of agents or, or smaller settings, okay? At least in econ. So like I said, there is an empirical part to the paper. I'm going to uh, almost entirely skip over it. I'm happy to talk more offline about it. Just that is, a, that, that is certainly a potential. I'll, 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 I mean, once I discuss the optimal thing, we can talk more about how that fits in. But um, yeah, I think I'll tell you the model before you decide whether that's uh, better or worse. OK. Um, great. Any more questions before I delve into the, the model? OK, terrific. So um, I'm going to be uh, in continuous time, and I'm going to be looking at steady state equilibria of the, of the system. Uh, my firms are going to have two different hidden types, okay? So they can either be good or bad, okay? Uh, and crucially, the beginning, when they enter the system, um, neither the firm nor the market knows about this quality, okay? So we're not like in a world which is typically in, in, in labor markets and occupational licensing where people know their, their type before they enter. Here's one where the firm 
doesn't know whether they've come up with a good idea or not. Okay, so the restaurant comes up with some notion, they don't know um, whether it's going to fit the market's kind of demands or not. Uh, so P0 is going to be a parameter that indexes the probability that one of these entering firms is the high type. And crucially, we're going to be learning about the theta of the firm through consumer feedback. Okay, so how does this thing work? So um, <clears throat> um, let me just explain this, um, this diffusion process to you. So if you look at the terms in, in black, all that is saying is that each consumer's review is a, is a normally distributed signal centered on the underlying quality of the firm. Okay, so the intuition is if I go to a good restaurant, then on average, I have a better meal than if I go to a bad restaurant, okay? But there's some noise, maybe I have some bad luck, maybe the chef is sick that day, whatever, okay? So it's just a statement about the average experience of these firms. Okay, but the crucial term here is the term in red. So this lambda of t basically denotes the rate at which reviews are being generated for the firm, okay? So this um, is going to be um, a, a sum of two components. Crucially, the first component is um, an endogenous sales process, okay? This captures the idea that the number of um, objects the firm sells in a unit time determines how much information is produced for that firm, okay? The more uh, consumers the firm serves, the more uh, reviews it gets, okay? So endogenous sales, and then there's also a second term, which is sort of an exogenous signal process, okay? This is really a technical... Uh, assumption that we can talk more about when I get to the equilibrium solution. Okay, but again, to stress, there's this intimate relationship between the quantity of sales that the firm makes and the rate at which it's getting feedback. And so the rate at which its, its rating is moving, okay? So um, at each moment in time, um, I want to keep track of the belief that we all have uh, of the firm's type, okay? So whether the firm is good or bad, because I only have two state variables a sufficient statistic for this belief is just uh, the posterior likelihood that the firm's type is the high type, okay? Based on all the information I get from the entire review process, okay? So I see all of these reviews, I form an estimate of the firm's type, and this forms a sufficient statistic for the firm's quality question. Oh, I beg your pardon. So this is a standard Wiener process. So this just um, encapsulates the fact that there is some randomness in the experience of the consumer. Okay, so in particular, if I just got rid of that, then um, we would know immediately what the underlying type of the firm is because if I get a good draw, then it's immediately obvious. Okay, that just means that it's noisy whether you have a good meal or a bad meal. Thanks. Okay, so this, um, this expected quality is what I'm going to call the rating of the firm. Okay, so I just want to make an important and interesting distinction between what I'm calling the rating and what you think of as the star rating of a, of, a, of a firm on these markets, okay? So go back to the original example. If I have one firm with five stars after one review and one firm with five stars after a million reviews, okay, you would think that the second has a higher expected quality, but they have the same star rating, okay? So my notion of a rating captures this difference in underlying quality, whereas the star rating doesn't, okay? This is a massive empirical issue in, in the literature on consumer reviews and ratings and stuff like that. Yes? Uh, is, am I right to guess that that's happening, that like the number is primarily coming in through like the customer's variance on, like estimate of the variance on their ratings? Or is uh, like, like, through, uh, like the number, like a customer is taking into account the number of ratings through like, their posterior? Um, so I'm not entirely sure. So I guess what I have in mind is that um, in order to compute the expected quality of the firm, the star rating is insufficient. Okay, I need to look at the stars and the number of reviews. Okay, that's effectively what is going on in my model, right? In my mind, I'm doing this computation is basically Bayes' rule, right? Uh, the more reviews I have that are good, the higher is the expected quality of the firm. Okay, put another way, if there's only one review for the firm, it doesn't really matter what that review is, in my world at least, because it's so noisy at the beginning, right? So that's, that's another way of looking at it. Yes? So do I know when someone enters the market or everyone enters at the same time? Very good. No, they do not. They enter in a, so this is going to be a model where firms are entering and exiting um, all, like continuously, okay? So 
Um, in theory, I could um, keep track of the exact age of the firm. It's not necessary to do so. Okay, so as long as I see the entire sequence of reviews for that firm, I know everything I need to know about the firm to compute as expected quality. Okay, so it's a good it's a good question. But in this model, I don't need to keep track of the age of the firm. Yes. So in steady state, you won't keep tra track of the vintage of the firm. No, I will not. That means that if I see a small number of reviews, I'm not going to infer that it's because it's a... I'm not going to be able to say that it's because it's a, new, it's a new firm. It's because it has had very few sales in the past. True. So, so okay, so very good. So that is true. And again, in, in, in this model, it doesn't matter. All right. So to some extent, the fact that I don't have many reviews is not indicative of, so I can't draw a distinction between a firm that's been around for a long time and only has three reviews, and a firm that's been around for hardly any time and has three reviews. So I'm not able to do that in the setting that I've set up for myself, okay? But that's an interesting distinction. Uh, I guess that would just make the entry problem even harder for the new entrant. Uh, They're competing, so if it's good, it will have lots of people, lots of reviews, right? I mean, that's, that's the essence of it. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So if, yeah. so if they have lots of reviews, then on average they're going to be older, of course. Yeah, yes. If you weren't bound by the stochastic process, like, would you design the reviews differently? Um, do you mean, would I design the, the, the scale? Is, that, is this what you mean? What do you mean by design? Like, I'm kind of wondering, like, we didn't show us the model yet, but when we go and we ask what's the first best, Will the first best will be such a process, or is this process like is this full tractability? Is this um... okay? So I guess two things. So first best meaning in a world where I know the underlying type of the firm. No, you don't. I mean that's trivial. That 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 world where I every firm that comes in, I know precisely their theta. Then I don't need a stochastic process. I can just assign consumers to each firm and throw out the bad firms. So in that world, I don't need any process at all. Um, the other way to I guess answer the question is, there's a reason why I have this stochastic process. It is micro-founded as an aggregation, okay? So the way you want to think about this is, think about a world in discrete time, okay? And in every instance, I just get a sum of uh, random variables. So each consumer has some outcome that's a random variable that's correlated with the type of the firm, right? If I take a continuous time limit of that, it's going to go to this Brownian motion. Yeah, but so that, that's the reason. That other things. I think you don't need to just look at the reviews from individuals coming. You can look at how many people come to the restaurants, the vintage, and all sort of other things. So oh. I'm kind of asking, like, oh, I beg your pardon. Says, like, in, right. In the first best, like in my world, like Yelp would not need to do anything different and would rely on this. Or is this like some yeah. world model that's like just going to make it easy to see what's going on? No. So again, I the, the the reason this is coming up is because I'm in a world where I'm just assuming that for the time being, Yelp isn't doing anything other than posting every review it gets, right? And in that world, this is the only stochastic process that makes sense. So later on, when I do the design problem, it's completely plausible that they might want to have a whole bunch of other things going on, the age of the firm, uh, other aspects of the, like other state variables to keep track of the firm's quality. And then I'll show you that it doesn't, it's not necessary. But that, that'll come later, okay, great, thanks. Okay, terrific. Um, so I want to do a simple application of Bayes' rule in continuous time. I take the prior belief regarding the firm's quality. I take all the information in the signal process, just one second, and I get a law of motion for how the rating of the firm evolves in continuous time, okay? So the rating moves, um, just a few things to say about this, the rating moves more rapidly the more reviews I get, okay? So if I'm getting lots of reviews, my rating moves faster. It moves more rapidly if each review is more precise. So that's what that's saying. So if there's an expert um, New York Times critic and he's got infinite precision, he comes and leaves one review, I know whether the firm is good or bad, okay? And also it moves more rapidly when I don't know much about the quality of the firm. So in particular, when the belief is around zero or one, I'm very, very certain of what the quality of the firm is, so Bayes' rule is incrementing very slowly, okay? I'm updating very slowly at that point. Oh, there was a question, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a model of adverse selection? Um, it's not a model of adverse selection because the firm doesn't know its type at the point of entry. Let's say it's a model in which 
which the current is not allowed to choose its qualities. Correct. Um, yes. But I tend to think that that's a first order importance problem when we're thinking about rating systems. Can you talk a little bit about that? Very good, yes. So uh, I could talk a lot about that. I'll talk a little about that. Um, so there are various ways in which you might think the firm can make, I call it intensive margin decisions that affect the quality. So Susan was, and, and, and previously we were talking about moral hazard, right? So whilst the firm is going through its life cycle, it can put effort into affecting the quality of its output. You might think ex ante choice, right? So I have to make a, rather than, I, I haven't told you the model yet, but that there might be an investment choice ex ante, okay? Short story is in virtually all of the extensions I have where that's a feature, the main, the main result of this paper will go through. So the incentive provision is qualitatively very similar. But if you want more details about it, we can talk happily offline. It's a very important question, of course. OK. So the, how are firms making their payoffs in this model? So they pay an entry cost to enter the market. OK. And once they're in the market, they pay a constant operating flow cost to remain active. OK. So the restaurant has to cover its rent, irrespective of its sales. Um, what's the revenue? So in this benchmark setting, the revenue of the firm is simply equal to the quantity of sales it makes per unit time. Okay? And that quantity is bound by a, an exogenous capacity constraint. So the firm physically cannot sell more than at a rate of uh, lambda bar per unit time. Okay? There are no prices. Later there will be prices. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So I think of these worlds as being both relevant. Uh, we've, I mean, we've, we've seen how congestion can be issues in these platforms. Right, in, in medical, medical services, I think, is a great fit where prices don't clear the market. There's a bunch of services where it's contestable whether there are competitive prices that clear the market. Products, I think, prices are obviously a better fit. So I want to do both. So I will do prices later. OK, so firms are discounting at a rate rho, and they face a constant hazard rate of exogenously um, being killed from the market, okay? So I didn't write this here, but the firm is maximizing its present discounted value. Um, I realize we're from disparate fuel, so that this, I mean, this is, this is how I would do it in these sort of problems, um, present discounted value. Okay, so there are some basic assumptions here. These just ensure that the market is non-empty, okay? So if the operating cost of the firm was greater than the maximum revenue that the firm could make in any instant, it would never make a profit, so it would never enter the market. Okay? Similarly, if the, if the entry cost was greater than the present discounted value of selling out forever, so that's what this thing is. Okay? If I sell out, I make that flow and discount it forever, okay? so I would never enter the market, okay? because even if I sold out forever, coming into the market would be too costly. Okay? So very basic assumptions. What are the strategies of the firm? So they choose whether to enter the market or not. So in equilibrium, what is this going to mean? It's going to mean that there's an entry rate by firms. So this eta is an endogenous object. It's, it's part of the equilibrium fixed point problem. And if they come in, if and when to exit the market. Okay, so this takes the form of a very standard optimal stopping problem. Um, the solution to which is an exit threshold p lower bar. Okay, so the firm has a state variable in my model. That state is its rating. Okay, the rating is going up and down depending on the reviews that it gets. If the rating goes low enough, it has to cover its uh, rent, but it's not getting any consumers. It decides to shut down altogether. Okay, so that's the nature of the the, the solution to the problem. Okay, so. Uh, in equilibrium, I'm going to have a positive measure of firms. So this is a competitive market. I don't have large players. I'm going to have a measure of small firms that are all effectively price takers. So the state variable of the entire system is the distribution of firms over their idiosyncratic states. Okay? So what I call this is the ratings distribution. Okay? At any moment, uh, each firm is floating around in its rating. But in a steady state, I'm going to have an invariant distribution of uh, firms over the different ratings that they can be at. Okay? And this thing is, um, is, um, is uh, defined over the, the space of ratings over which firms remain active. Okay? So below P star, the density of firms is zero because they will exit at P. Sorry, P lower bar. Okay, yes? Consumers are not making decisions based on the rating but based on the posterior. Yes. The, the firms are 
making the choosing an exit threshold on the rating and not on the consumer's posterior. Whoa, 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 whoa. So the rating and the posterior is the same thing, right? P is what I call the rating, but this is also the posterior estimates at any moment of the of the firm's quality, right? So. It's not the star rating. So now your rating. Okay, so let me let me talk about consumers for a second. Okay, so my consumers. Let me just do these and then I'll get right there. Okay, so they're, they're in fixed supply, whereas the, the firms are deciding whether to enter, so their supply is endogenous. They're short-lived, so they're, my, they're myopic, and they're risk-neutral. Okay, so when they go to a firm with expected quality P, that's their expected utility of consumption. Okay, so here's their choice problem. I call it directed search with random rationing for literature-specific reasons. So they can see the entire... Um, ratings distribution at any moment, okay? They see every firm in the market indexed by its rating, i.e. its expected quality or its posterior. That is the state variable that they're using to make their decision, okay? So again, it goes back to this point that I made earlier that you, you, you look at the star rating, but at least in, in my model, you also combine with it the number of reviews. And both things go into um, your choice of whether to go to the firm or not, okay? Great. So um, let's say that 100 consumers turn up to a firm with a capacity constraint of 50, then um, uh, you have a 50-50 chance of being served and getting your expected utility of consumption and a 50-50 chance of being thrown out and getting nothing, okay? So that's the random rationing element of the model. Um, so uh, the solution to this problem is also a threshold policy. The consumer's problem is a threshold policy. Okay, so there's now going to be a consumer's rating threshold P star above which consumers turn up to these firms and they start congesting the market, okay? So consumers, because of their choice problem, there are no search costs in particular. They can choose any firm in the market. They have to be indifferent between any firm that they can choose. So what happens is um, as the quality of the firm gets better, the probability that I get served there goes down because there's a whole load of people also wanting to be served there. Okay, so you go to a better restaurant, at least in Manhattan, um, you're going to wait in a longer queue, or you have to book like 10 years in advance. Okay, that's the trade-off that you face in this model. Um, another important um, aspect of this is that it gives a very easy measure of consumer surplus in my model. Okay, P star, this threshold at which they go to, is precisely the right measure of consumer welfare in an equilibrium. Why? So the guys that go to P star are served immediately. That's the definition of this threshold. So they get P star for sure, okay? At any other restaurant, they have to be indifferent, okay? So the queue offsets the quality. So that means consumers in expectation are getting P star irrespective of the firm that they go to, okay? So that means every consumer is getting P star in equilibrium, so P star is the measure of consumer welfare. Yes? Consumer surplus means size of the market here? Mm, good question, no, because the distribution of the market, so fix a quantity of firms and then change the distributional curvature of F, that changes P star. Mm -hmm. So that's a simple answer, okay. But fix a functional form for F and just scale it all up, have more of each firm in the market, then P star goes up. So do you understand? Like more firms in the market is good, but we only want more good firms in the market. Yeah. More or uh, we can continue, you can come back to me if you want. Yeah. 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 How important is the measure one assumption here? Because uh, in some markets you're not gonna have you're going to have the rationing on the other side of the market. So. Oh, um, so in, in, in some sense, it's not important because I have free entry by firms. So whatever the, the w well, what is important is that one side has an exogenous measure and the other has an endogenous measure. Okay, so, and as long as there's free entry on one side, then the ratio is going to be the same in equilibrium. So if I had put some other constant there, it would have scaled down the entry rate linearly. So in that sense, it's not important. But if the entry choice was by consumers and not by firms, that would change things. Okay, so of course, my whole story is about the incentives for firms. So that's why I wanted to do it this way. But that's an interesting, I mean, obviously consumers will make an endogenous choice between platforms you know, in, a, you know, in a broader setting, but 
no, not in this paper. Yes. Um, so I, I don't I don't know if this matters or not. So the expectation is kind of inside. Yes. The argument there. Correct. There, is there an alternate version of this where consumers have access to the posterior, in which case they'd be taking the expectation on the outside, right? So you'd have like, because I guess what's happening here is that every customer is making their decision based on P, mm -hmm. and that's why they optimize this way. Mm -hmm. But um, if I think about your motivation, then in fact, there's a lot of information that is giving me access to the posterior, right? And I could have conditioned my decision on the posterior directly instead. Like, I guess I'm wondering, is there a sufficiency theorem somewhere that says that, oh. the, yes. that the expectation against the posterior is a sufficient system? Good. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I was being too slow. But that, 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 so now, now I'm with you. Yeah, so uh, because of the simple, like, there, there are various aspects of my model that allows P to be a sufficient statistic, right? In, in a more general setting, it would not be. So, for instance, if I had, rather than binary states, if I had a normally distributed state space, so I had a linear Gaussian control problem, then I'd need to keep track of an extra variable, which would be the age of the firm. Uh, so yes, so this is entirely model specific. Uh, the part that would be, I think, robust to a bunch of um, assumptions is the idea that the, the entry belief is closer to the exit threshold than the average firm. So there's this, because of ex post selection, the average firm is better than the average entrant because we weed out some of the bad firms. So that, I think, would be robust. But this sufficient thing is, is not. That just gives me a lot of tractability. Yeah, thanks. Yes. So just so I understand this, uh, so the consumers are a priori identical. Correct. But distinguish themselves by choosing different levels. Although they're indifferent between all the levels, yes. they just distribute themselves. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So, Again, in reality, the good question. So in reality, of course, consumers have idiosyncrasy in their preferences. I just wanted the simplest model to, yeah. I mean, if we had horizontal differentiation between consumers, it might make the entry problem even worse. Um, because now I have to find my niche, that kind of thing. Yeah, thanks. OK, so I just wanted to very briefly justify why I'm closing the consumer problem this way. I think the rest of the model, it, there, there weren't really any choices to make here. There were, I could, there were many ways I could do this. So I think this is a natural trade-off in these platforms. I hope this audience is with me on that, that I'm trading off quality against congestion or the, the wait time of, of service provision. Um, it's very tractable for reasons that have been made transparent. And Importantly, I didn't want to embed in the model discovery frictions. Okay, so we talked a lot, and uh, the literature talks about these search frictions that consumers have just finding products in the market. These platforms help with that. Okay, that's not my motivation, so I didn't want to build that into the model and give it an artificial um, externality that I needed to solve with my design problem. Okay, so in my model, consumers can see every option in the market. Okay, the only thing to design is how much we know about those options. Right, so now I want to delve in to solve for the equilibrium of this model. I want to turn to the firm's continuation value. Okay, so the stopping problem in a very standard way can be turned into a, into a recursive problem. There's a Bellman equation that's associated with the firm's continuation problem with some boundary conditions and whatnot. So on the x-axis here is the firm state variable, so the belief or the rating of the firm. Okay, P star is the level at which consumers start to turn up. So below P star, my firm is making no profits because no one's turning up. In fact, it's making negative profits because it has to cover its operating cost. And above P star, it's selling out. Okay, it's selling out of capacity immediately, basically. It has a bigger and bigger Q, but in this benchmark without any prices, it's not, it's not internalizing that selling out. Okay. Right, so the fact that the firm is learning gradually through feedback means that the continuation problem of the firm is is, uh, oh, crumbs, right, 10 minutes, wow, okay, let me get on with it, is, um, is S-shaped. Um, okay, so it has this kind of funky non-concavity to it. So this really is important, so I'll take a moment to explain what's going on here. So for the high-rated firms, they are selling out. They don't want any feedback at all, right, because they've al they're already doing as well as they can. So all that feedback does is allow them the possibility of losing their rating and with it all of their consumers, okay? So that's why their problem is concave. The closer they get to this threshold, the, the, the more their continuation is eroded because they might lose all their consumers. On the other hand, the, the low-rated firms have a convex problem because they're not getting any profits. 
the only way they get profits is by getting a high enough rating. So they want a lot of feedback immediately, okay? Either it tells me I'm really crap and I should just leave the market, or it tells me I'm good and I'm gonna get a lot of profits, okay? So, whereas the, um, so this is the continuation problem of the firm, the HOV problem. So, whereas the, the low-rated firms want a lot of information and the high-rated firms don't, in equilibrium is precisely the reverse that's going on, okay? The high-rated firms are getting a lot of consumer feedback because that's where all the consumers are turning up and under full transparency, that's where they're all leaving their reviews, okay? The low-rated firms are getting very little. They're just ticking along with this uh, exogenous background rate, okay? So this is the, what I would call the misallocation in the firm's problem that is gonna tell us exactly what to do when we get to the design part, okay? So just keep this in mind. Sorry, I'm missing something. When the rating goes below P star? Yes. No, you, yes, yes, right. You're not getting, then you, are you get, you're yeah. not getting any more uh, feedback as so well. So epsilon, I have this little exogenous signal process. So in particular, very good. If I didn't have that, P star would be equal to P lower bar. Right? As soon as I lose all my consumers, I just leave the market. So it's some technical steady state reasons why I want this region here. Um, but also I do want some reasons in my model why consumers turn up to firms that are independent of their rating. As, as some do, right? They, they don't get to choose, they're just impatient, they go to the first place, they don't use the platform full stop. Right? So I want some people like that. Good, but they leave reviews nonetheless. Okay, so um, the ratings distribution. So I think, I, I, uh, um, uh, I think I'm gonna skip this. So there are some very interesting aspects of the ratings distribution that turns up in equilibrium. The main empirical prediction is that is about the tail parameter of the distribution. So if you know about Pareto tails, this distribution has a fatter right tail than it does left tail, okay? So that's a robust prediction of the model. Um, I did a little empirical section in the paper that I absolutely don't have time to talk about right now um, that has some evidence that this is in fact what's going on, at least in the setting that I tested using Yelp data and restaurants. Okay, but summarizing under this benchmark of full transparency, we get a unique steady state, a stationary equilibrium. It's unique, uh, it features positive rates of entry, rates of exit, and this, this congestion at the highest rates of firms in the market. Okay. More predictions of the model. I, I think I'm gonna skip over this. This is just here to convince us that this is the right positive theory to be looking at because there are plenty of predictions that, uh, that validate the model. A lot of these have been um, studied in the literature already, in the empirical literature. Okay, I'm definitely skipping this. This is just a technical description of what, um, how equilibrium is defined. Anyone who's interested in mean field games, um, come and ask me afterwards. Happy to talk about it offline. Okay, but the important part here is to talk about ratings design. So um, now I'm gonna think of a platform whose objective in my world is consumer welfare. Okay, so there's a very interesting discussion to be have about what the right objective is. Think of this as a first pass at a normative a normative exercise. So I care about consumer welfare for various reasons, whether I be a regulator or a platform, um, this is, this is uh, the objective I'm gonna take. And remember, consumer welfare is just this equilibrium object P star, right? So I wanna maximize the P star associated with my design policy. That's the aim of the game. Um, I should point out that because my firms are making zero profits in equilibrium, actually consumer welfare is equal to overall welfare, all right? Um, but I'd like you to think more about consumer welfare, I think. But more importantly, the instrument that I'm allowing my designer to, to um, optimize over is a filtering of the review process to shape the way the ratings evolve for, uh, for the firm, okay? So in particular, I can exclude or include reviews, and this changes the rate at which the firm's rating is updated, okay? Um, I think I want to skip a lot of the technicalities here because I'm really running short on time. Um, the policies that I'm looking at in words do the following. At any instant, the platform gets, let's say 10 reviews in for that firm. As a function of the current rating of the firm, it can suppress some fraction of those reviews, okay? So for instance, it doesn't have to put any of them into the rating and so the rating would be constant or it could put them all in and update the rating, okay? That is in words, the set of policies I'm looking at. In particular, 
full transparency belongs to this class, okay, by setting the suppression rate equal to zero, okay? I don't suppress any of them. So I like this class because it has, you know, appealing features. It's, they would be easy to implement. They're very easy to study for me technically. Um, uh, just one thing I would say that certification is when above a certain rating, I don't include any new reviews at all. So this is like giving that firm a badge. They get that rating forever and they don't, and they sort of keep this badge. Okay. Yes. So whether I show a review or not is not a function of what the review itself. No, very good. This is a commitment policy. I'm not doing, that's a good review. I included that's a bad review. I don't. Okay. It's a black box. I have 10 reviews. I don't know their realizations. I just decide I, I pick some fraction of them randomly out of there. Good. Would that policy... Uh, it's not obvious whether... Policy would be able to do better? Than it's not obvious that it... it you would think so. My, let's talk more after, afterwards. It's, it's not obvious, so it needs a discussion. Yeah. Consumers are aware of your rating policy? Yes. Yeah. They're aware. Absolutely. Yeah. So my consumers are extremely rational. I realize that this is a different... Like, so they, they can compute every equilibrium object perfectly in expectation. Okay, so this is a rational expectations equilibrium. Um, good. Okay, so this is the main takeaway from the, from the benchmark. Setting the optimal rating policy is... Oh, I didn't even define this thing. It's, it's all or nothing. So what this means in words is above the equilibrium consumer's rating, I don't release any information at all. Below the rating, I release every review that comes through. Okay, so that was what my definition of all or nothing is. Okay, so um, five minutes. How many, how many minutes do I have? Oh my lord. Okay. Okay, rounding up. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so, I think the easiest way to think about this is is the following. So. Um, The ratings policy provides incentives for firms in two different ways. Firstly, the policy shapes where consumers go and hence which firms are making profits. Secondly, the policy shapes how fast it takes me to, to move through the rating space. Okay? So it changes the curvature of my continuation problem. Okay? Now what the platform wants to do, because it's thinking of consumer surplus, is maximize P star. Right? By pushing P star up, I'm screwing my firms because they don't get to make profits until they're a lot older, right? When P star goes up, on average, they're older, okay? So this is depressing incentives for firms. I need to compensate them because ultimately I want a lot of firms in my market, okay? As I was having this discussion earlier, the more firms in the market, typically the better a consumer's off because the capacity constraint means you know, if I have 10 good firms, now I have 100 good firms, that's great, okay? Because I can serve all of my consumers at the best place in town, okay? So I want more firms in the market, but I'm depressing their incentives by increasing P star. So what do I have to do? I have to think about this other channel of providing incentives for the firms. I have to design the ratings policy to maximize the speed of which they're going through their ratings and incentivize them to participate, okay? Now, we remember from the firm's problem that what they wanted was fast, slow. Remember that? Whereas what they got was slow, fast, okay? So this policy is basically doing the best thing for firms in, in that dimension. It's slowing down reviews at the top, stimulating more firms to come in because this is good for them, and thus improving consumer welfare. Okay. So I'm afraid I don't have time to talk about prices at all. I better, I, he's telling me one minute. So <laughs> let me just... Um, um, I, I don't have time really to talk about prices. Simple takeaway is uh, certification is, is going to be better than transparency. Okay, So we still want to have this kind of region at the top where we're not providing firms with information. Okay, So, uh, and no details, unfortunately. So the summary is um, there's this barrier to entry problem for these firms because of incomplete information. I studied the design problem of looking at ratings. And the optimal policy involves throwing away reviews for incumbents in order to give new entrants a better shot at penetrating the market. Um, more applications for future work. Okay. Thanks a lot. I guess there are some. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so your customers are homogeneous, yes. right? And so um, uh, if, if you had heterogeneity among your customers, then, you know, and you don't control the matching as a platform. So you could potentially, you know, um, have bad matches forming, right? 
you, you would have like uh, mm -hmm. customers that value quality being matched to low quality firms. So do you have a sense of how? Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. So that's one comment, and the second comment would be: suppose that your objective as a platform, kind of similar uh, question, is not consumer welfare, but overall, you know, like a uh, overall profit that the firms make, because you you get a cut of it. Ah, yeah. So, how would you, your results? Yeah, cool. So on the, on, the, um, on the first point, I think there's still an entry problem in the following sense. So now let's say that the, the low type firms actually generate value. So now the firm's problem looks a little bit like a U, right? When I'm known to be low, there's a whole section of consumers that actually likes that. At the beginning, I still don't know what kind of firm I am. Okay? So there's still this issue of trying to reveal what type of firm there is through the feedback. Uh, the exit problem becomes more aligned with the entry problem in some ways. Okay, so you know, the, I might decide to leave immediately because people want to know whether I'm a hipster cafe or not, and they have horizontal preferences for that. But until they know, they you know. So I think the entry margin is still pretty problematic even in that world. So the second question: different objective functions. This is obviously a very important question. So, um, like I said, overall surplus. The, the same thing goes through. If I'm looking at a commission on prices, just on, so on, on, on transaction, on, so on prices, okay? So I take the price of a transaction and I take a fraction of that away. It can go either way, okay? Because on the one hand now, the platform doesn't like competition by firms. It wants only a few firms. They get to corner the market and I can extract more surplus. On the other hand, if I charge a flat fee per transaction, so I want to maximize the, the, not, like the average quality, then my policy is still optimal, okay? Exactly, exactly. So again, I think a more encyclopedic treatment of objectives is beyond, is beyond this, but that's, that's my intuition for that, yeah, thanks. So coming back to my question before, if you would just, instead of oh, right, yeah. off mm -hmm. and not including any further reviews, you yeah. would just cut off Hide, right. hide the sort of earlier reviews. Yes, so I tell you why. So, not quite. So the intuition is the same in the sense that I don't want them to amass a big stock of reviews. And so by lobbying them off at the beginning, I keep their stock bounded. So two reasons why that's different. One, well, not different, but the reason it doesn't have a role here is because for my firms have a fixed type throughout their life. So different vintages of reviews are equally informative, right? So. Zero one. Right? I mean, it's, no, 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 it's, either, no. it's either high or low, and it doesn't change. They don't change. That they don't change exactly. So if and I'm in a, and eventually you discover it because exactly. Zero one. Right. Yeah. So in any world where there's moral hazard or there's some evolving type, I want to lob off earlier it would reviews. Be nice if it would be the same value if you hide, because yeah. then it would be more realistic for firms. Right. Which might totally. So if a good restaurant gets. Yeah. gets after a while. Right, right. So if, if my objective was being realistic, then I'd have to have that in there. Uh, there are just a bunch of papers that look at that margin, and so I didn't want to have it in there without a, a story to be telling. As it were. Sorry, I'm, I've, gone, I've gone over, I guess I should. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a break now. Uh, John Horton, unfortunately, had to cancel just a couple of days back, and Steve told me to take his slot. Uh, so I did. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that there's coffee outside. <laughs> And if you've seen my talk before, or you really wanted to see John, you can just, you're not going to see John, but you can come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay, if not, I'm going to be speaking here at uh, 3.45. Okay, thank you, Nicole.